Why are so many dogs suffering from health issues? Actress Katherine Heigl, who's helped over 16,000 dogs through her foundation, says she's seeing more issues with dogs' joints, odors, and health than ever before. After doing a ton of research, she feels there's one place we can look to improve any dog's health, their food. What she discovered is that the way many dog foods are made can actually create toxins that could be wrecking our dog's health. And this is true even for many premium brands. Fortunately, she found that just by adding a few special superfoods to her dog's food, she saw huge transformations in their health. She's made a 20-minute video explaining step-by-step how anyone can do the same thing to see incredible changes in their dog's health. Reflecting on this, I decided to follow her advice, and I noticed profound changes in my own dogs. Enhanced energy, healthier skin, and an overall younger demeanor. It's truly heartwarming to see them so vibrant and full of life. Go to badlandsfood.com slash hometown and watch Catherine's video right now. Again, that's B-A-D-L-A-N-D-S-F-O-O-D dot com slash hometown. Welcome back, friend, to Hometown History. We often see some names linger in the shadows of history, hardly making it into the limelight, but quietly crafting the world we live in today. And one such name is Lewis Howard Latimer, a name you might not have heard much, but there is no doubt about the mark his contributions have left. Latimer worked with some of the greatest inventors in history, but never actually properly credited for his work. And you will be shocked by the kind of stuff he was involved in. So in today's episode, we will explore his work, work that continues to influence our world, even today. Let's rewind the clock and take a closer look at the early chapters of Lewis Latimer's journey. Born on September 4, 1848, in Chelsea, Massachusetts, Lewis was the youngest of four children, and given his background, it seemed unlikely he would ever brush shoulders with scientists, physicists, or inventors. You see, George and Rebecca were no strangers to adversity. They had escaped enslavement in Virginia in 1842 hiding beneath the deck of a ship bound north. This was a big deal, of course. Also, because during the time when Louis Latimer's parents escaped, the state was home to more than 500,000 enslaved black people, making up one-third of its population in 1860. But their search for freedom hit a snag when George was recognized in Boston and arrested. Thanks to lawyers Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, and the support of other activists, he did manage to get free again. But the struggle was far from over. George Latimer vanished after the Dred Scott decision in 1857, a dark period when the Supreme Court ruled that an enslaved man could not sue for his freedom. He was still fearing the shadows of enslavement, Rightfully so, and he soon went underground, leaving the rest of the Latimer family with a great deal of hardships ahead of them. Now fast forward to Lewis's 15th birthday. Determined to support his family, he started taking on odd jobs, until finally enlisting in the U.S. Navy during the Civil War, and served on the USS Massasoit. He earned an honorable discharge in 1865, and then returned to Boston. Here, he joined the patent law firm, Crosby & Gould, starting as an office assistant. But he was not a typical one. He wasn't just fetching coffee. He was observing the drafters and teaching himself the ropes of mechanical drawing and drafting. And if you are not aware, drafting is like drawing, but for a different purpose. 
It's about making detailed plans and diagrams for inventions or buildings. For example, you have this amazing idea for a new gadget. But before you can build it, you need to make precise drawings showing how it'll work and what it'll look like from different angles. That's where drafting comes in. And these plans are also incredibly important in getting a patent for your new invention, just to make sure no one ever tries to copy your idea. So it was this observation and his curiosity that would help him achieve the great things he is remembered for today. Latimer quickly climbed the rankings thanks to his undeniable talent and compromise. He taught himself to use the set square, ruler, and other drafting tools, making him more valuable to the company. From a salary of $3 per week, which is around $57 today, he was now earning $20 a week as the head draftsman. That would be about $420 today. And everyone, including his boss, seemed to realize his value. He became the go-to draftsman, designing his very own inventions along the way. And we will talk about all of them, one invention at a time. Now in the post-Civil War era, scientific and engineering breakthroughs were all the more common. And Latimer didn't just sit back and watch. He was working independently, and he soon understood that there was potential profit and spotting a technical issue, creating a solution beneficial to both the inventor and the public, and obtaining a patent for it as well. And this was the beginning of his journey. The first patent he received was on February 10, 1874, when the U.S. Patent Office granted Latimer and fellow inventor Charles M. Brown patent number 147,363 for the design of a toilet. He was only 26 years old. This design was basically an improvement to the bathroom compartments of trains. The idea was to use a trap door, activated by the lid, for easy emptying, much like the flush system that is used today. That was one of the many inventions that were about to follow, and one of the most notable being the telephone. Now, if you are confused and thinking, wasn't the telephone invented by Graham Bell? Don't worry, you're right, but there's more to the story. So back in 1874, Alexander Graham Bell, the person we all know as the inventor of the telephone, was experimenting with something called the harmonic telegraph. His idea was to send multiple tones through telegraph wires using a device with lots of metal reeds tuned like a harp. The idea was there, but he needed someone to help him put it down on paper. And who better than Latimer to do that? So in March 1875, Latimer got to work with Bell and his lawyer, sketching out the plans for this groundbreaking invention. But as you might have known, at the same time, another inventor named Elisha Gray was also trying to patent a similar device. And with that, things got interesting. Latimer took the responsibility seriously, dedicating long hours into the night on February 14, 1876. He completed the patent application just in time, submitting it a mere hours before Gray. And thanks to this hard work, Bell secured the patent rights and became the official inventor of the telephone. Bell's patent covered the method of an apparatus for transmitting vocal and other sounds telegraphically by causing electrical undulations similar in form to the vibrations of the air accompanying the said vocal or other sound. Now, even though his name is not directly associated with this invention, it was a defining moment in his career, and it established him as an expert drafter in this industry. And this was only the beginning. 
it seems Vladimir was getting himself into inventor wars. Because in 1880, his name popped up in another rivalry. This time, Vladimir joined forces with Hiram Maxim, the chief competitor of Thomas Edison, and his company, the United States Electric Lighting Company. The company was at the forefront of the electric lighting industry, aiming to develop a more cost-effective and sustainable alternative to gas lighting. Vladimir was introduced to the work of Thomas Edison, who had recently patented the first commercially viable incandescent light bulb. For some context, an incandescent light bulb is a type of electric light that produces light by heating a filament wire until it glows. So, when an electric current flows through the filament, it will heat it up and as a result, produce visible light. Now, Edison's initial bulb design utilized a carbonized bamboo filament, which significantly prolonged its lifespan compared to previous models. But that did not mean it was the best model. There were still challenges to overcome, including the manufacturing process and overall durability. And when I say prolonged lifespan, I mean yes, it lasts longer than previous models, but not long enough. Realistically, you cannot keep changing your bulbs every few days, and the bamboo filament inside these bulbs would have you doing just that. It was just poor design. So there was an opportunity here to improve. So competing electric companies, including Maxim's, were scrambling to be the first to create a solution. Before we continue our journey through the life of Lewis Howard Latimer, let's take a moment to talk about the present, specifically your present mealtime dilemma. Picture this, you're knee deep in research, the clock ticking away, and suddenly hunger strikes. But fear not fellow history enthusiasts, because Factor Meals has your back. With Factor's no prep, no mess meals, you can satisfy your hunger without missing a beat their chef-crafted creations from Calorie Smart to Protein Plus and Keto Options. Treat yourself to restaurant-quality meals featuring premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon. Say goodbye to shopping, prepping, cooking, and cleaning up. Factor Meals has got you covered. Head to factormeals.com slash hometownhistory50 and use code hometownhistory50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code HOMETOWNHISTORY50 at factormeals.com slash hometownhistory50 to get 50% off your first box, plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Vladimir immersed himself in the study of electricity, quickly mastering its complexities. In 1882, he and fellow engineer, Joseph Nicholas, obtained a patent for a new filament manufacturing method. The idea here was to encase carbon filaments in cardboard envelopes during heat treatment, ensuring their integrity and durability. This breakthrough allowed for the production of filaments with unique shapes, such as Maxim's own M-shaped filaments, that we still see today. It may seem pretty simple now, but it made a huge difference. It protected the filament from breaking and made the bulbs last much longer. Plus it made them cheaper to produce and more efficient too. Talk about a bright idea. Other than that, Vladimir also devised more efficient methods for attaching carbonized filaments to their platinum wire supports, further enhancing the bulb's durability. His contributions led to improvements in various aspects of lamp manufacturing, from filament baking ovens to glass blowing equipment. And with that, electric lighting became a reality in homes and on streets. People could finally enjoy the convenience and safety of electric lights without worrying about them 
burning out all the time. So all of this meant that Latimer's reputation in the lighting industry skyrocketed, and soon he was in high demand across the country to solve lighting problems. From Philadelphia to New York City and Montreal to railroad stations in New England, Latimer led the charge in bringing electric lights to the masses. But wait, it gets better. By 1890, Latimer's skills caught the eye of none other than Thomas Edison himself. Recognizing his talent and expertise in the field, he hired Latimer to be his right-hand man. So Latimer became Edison's chief draftsman and patent expert, overseeing all of Edison's patent work. He even went to court to defend Edison's inventions against copycats. So he definitely made a major contribution to this field, leading him to be named a member of the Edison Pioneer, a group that helped create the electrical industry as we know it today. Of its 28 charter members, Latimer was the only African American, and that was something. With all his new accolades, Latimer went on to participate in several other projects and hold other patents. In 1894, Louis Latimer made significant strides in the field of innovation by introducing a new safety elevator, which was an improvement over the previous one, enhancing the overall security and functionality of buildings. But not all of his work involved that type of seriousness, if you will. He came up with some inventions to make our lives easier. First up, he created something called locking racks. These devices were perfect for places like restaurants and hotels. They held hats, coats, and umbrellas securely so they wouldn't get lost or stolen. Seems simple now, but this was a big deal at the time. Other than that, Latimer invented the improved book supporter, or bookends. You know how books can sometimes flop over on shelves? His book supporter kept books standing upright, neat, and tidy. Simple, yet effective. Now going back to the more serious ones, Latimer invented an early version of the air conditioner, complete with the first high-efficiency particle air, or HEPA filter. He called it the apparatus for cooling and disinfecting. The aim of this invention was to provide a large surface for evaporation, and tended to cool the air around it or pass over it to infuse it with chemical substances such as carbolic acid or bromochlorolum. This would eliminate any odors or disease-causing germs present. So this objective was achieved by suspending a textile fabric, such as webbing, between a reservoir and a drip or between multiple reservoirs ensuring that the fabric remained saturated and continuously supplied moisture through evaporation. To simplify things, it was designed to cool the air or get rid of odors and germs by using wet fabric stretched between reservoirs. What was especially interesting was that this invention offered flexibility in its arrangement to suit various environments or purposes whether used horizontally or vertically for deodorizing, disaffecting, or cooling. This device's design may be adjusted accordingly, with the primary components, the reservoirs and fabric, remaining fairly consistent. So pretty soon, hospitals started using it to keep dust and germs from spreading in public areas and patient rooms, making them cleaner and safer places for everyone. This was yet another important one, and paved the way for the development of modern air conditioning systems, humidifiers, and air purifiers, all of which rely on similar principles of evaporative cooling and air purification. So all of these inventions tell us that Latimer wasn't just a one-hit wonder. He kept on inventing things that would make life better for everyone, from safer elevators to cleaner hospitals. However, even though his contributions were significant, 
he felt that he was discriminated against at some level during his career. Writing about himself in third person, he said every new workman who came into the office saw for the first time a colored man making drawings, and as often as they came to work in the office, they tried to pretend that they could not do their work. It is unfortunate, but Latimer didn't let prejudice stop him. Instead, he worked even harder to prove himself. He was determined to become someone the whites couldn't ignore. He did all sorts of things to improve himself, like painting, playing music, and writing poetry and plays. Latimer didn't have much formal education, and he taught himself a lot, and even taught others technical drawing, engineering, and English. And since he faced a lot of racism himself, he became a big supporter of civil rights. In 1895, he even wrote a statement in connection with the National Conference of Colored Men about equality, security, and opportunity for others like him. Later in 1903, the Latimer family purchased a house in the mostly white neighborhood of Flushing, Queens. Situated on Holly Street, the house was not extravagant, but rather a relatively new Queen Anne suburban cottage constructed between 1887 and 1889 for a family named Sexton. This house became Latimer's lifelong residence. He even helped set up a church in this neighborhood. Now, Latimer believed in the principles of social justice for black people, as outlined in the Constitution. So he engaged with prominent black intellectuals of his time, including Frederick Douglass, Booker Washington, and Richard Theodore Greener. You might remember Richard Greener as the first African-American Harvard graduate. He was a scholar, diplomat, and key figure in organizing the National Conference of Colored Men in Detroit in 1895. With these interactions, the Latimer home became a hub for gatherings among leading black cultural and political figures. Poet-composer James Weldon Johnson his brother, Rosamund Johnson, composer Harry Burley, actor-singer Paul Robeson, and writer-activist Dubois, among others, frequented the Latimer household. As you can guess, socially Latimer was doing well, continuing to contribute to the development of those around him. But unexpectedly, in 1911, the Board of Patent Control disbanded, leaving Latimer without employment or prospects. He struggled to find work for a while, which is unfortunate considering his obvious talent in the business. But he was finally hired by an old friend and colleague, Edwin Hammer, another member of Edison's Pioneers. Latimer then served as Hammer's patent consultant until 1922, when declining health forced his retirement at the age of 74. He passed away on December 11, 1928, at the age of 80, and the Edison Pioneers published an obituary. It read, in part, He was of the colored race, the only one in our organization, and was one of those to respond to the initial call that led to the formation of the Edison Pioneers, January 24, 1918. Broad-mindedness, versatility, and the accomplishment of things intellectual and cultural. A linguist, a devoted husband and father, all were characteristic of him, and his genial presence will be missed from our gatherings. So owing to his work, he was honored on May 10th 1968, with the dedication of a public school in Brooklyn, New York, known as the P.S. 56 Lewis Latimer School. It is one of the few ways he is still remembered, not as widely as Edison or Graham Bell, which is unfortunate given the size of his contributions to their projects. 
And that is a wrap on today's exploration into the journey of Lewis Howard Latimer, an inventor, a draftsman, and an all-around genius who helped light up our world. Thank you for listening to Hometown History, and be sure to follow along for more interesting stories from the past. <laughs>